Starting off fifth place strong, we've got a narrowly avoided death. This tale takes place when long-term nurse Jenny was placed in charge of caring for an elderly woman with no family who was admitted to the hospital when her husband passed away. She didn't speak often, but when she did, it was usually just words that made no sense together. Jenny felt bad for her because ever since she'd arrived, so many of the residents in her area that she, you know, seemed to enjoy spending time with had passed. She put up a picture of each of them next to her, the pictures of her husband and several others who were probably just family to remember them. Being an extremely empathetic person, Jenny felt sorry for this woman and strived to give her extra attention whenever she could and formed a bond with the lady. It just seemed so unfair that she had, you know, such luck and kept losing people that she cared about. One day she looked at Jenny and said, plain as day, sweetie, I think I'm done now and handed Jenny a picture. It was a picture of Jenny and she smiled because it touched her heart that she was so important to the old woman. She passed nearly a week later and poor Jenny cried for days from the loss. The old lady knew it was the end and she said goodbye as best she could. Now fast forward to just under two years later when Jenny was talking with a colleague and that old lady came up in conversation. Her colleague referred to the lady as that crazy, um, uh, explicit word for a female dog, which seemed very out of character for her and it shocked and offended Jenny deeply. She expressed this to her colleague, not so nicely, and the lady looked at Jenny with a shocked look and said, oh dear, do you not know? And then proceeded to explain something to Jenny that, uh, she in fact hadn't known. As it turned out, it came out sometime after she had passed that the old lady had killed her husband by poisoning him and that there was an investigation because it appeared that she had a ritual of befriending someone, obtaining a picture of them, and hiding the picture until she could kill them, usually by poisoning and then displaying the picture as some sort of a trophy. It was suspected that this may have been the reason for the spike in mortality rate during her stay and the considerable amount of photos in her collection. The last Jenny heard, the old family photos weren't any relation to the old woman, and the police were trying to ID the individuals and compare them to several cold cases. Sheesh. Thank goodness Jenny survived to tell the tale. In fourth place, time to tell the tale of a rocking bed. Nope, not a rocking horse, rocking chair, or you know, like an ottoman. A bed. I know water beds are out of style and like a major safety hazard, but maybe this could inspire them to come back. New nurse Demi was working one of her first ever overnight shifts when a relative of one of her patients raced into the nurse's station out of breath, screaming that she needed to come quick. Unable to elaborate, saying Demi had to see what she was talking about for herself. Our nurse made her way to the room in question, where this little old lady patient was crying and holding onto the bed for dear life, all while her bed was shaking extremely violently. Now, you're probably thinking that the lady was the one causing all that shaking, but apparently she was this like frail, practically emaciated older lady who didn't even possess the strength to like rattle the rails. The ward only had two other patients in it, and everyone in there was huddled in a corner, shaking in fright until it eventually subsided. Apparently that particular ward was rarely used, and the bed that the old lady was in was used even less. People who have laid in it complained of nightmares where they hear screams and laughter of angry children. I guess some restless spirit called dibs in that particular bed, and Demi would very much like it to uh, pick somewhere else to hold court. Please and thanks. Number three on this list is the Riverview Hospital. This hospital is located in British Columbia and was still operating and doing some horrible practices way longer than anyone would care to admit. It was first built in the early 1900s in a less populated part of BC. It had almost 250 acres of land to itself and a bunch of different buildings that served various purposes. There was one building called the West Lawn Pavilion which actually was said to house the most disturbed male patients in the whole country. This part of the hospital eventually shut down in 1983 but the rest of the place where a bunch of questionable practices were going down, that didn't shut down until 2010. That's right guys, 2010. Literally only 12 years ago, this place was still operating. Reports revealed that the hospital still employed electroshock therapy in the 21st century and allegedly illegally sterilized a number of patients. In 2005, nine women received settlements totaling $450,000 following a joint lawsuit filed against the facility over the alleged sterilizations. As much as I want so badly to believe that we are out of this era of poor mental health, we might not fully be. That happened just over a decade ago. If you were sent to this place only a few years prior, then you may have had to deal with this. Kind of makes you wonder how many other places around the world are still conducting horrible treatments that we don't know about. 
Number two on this list is the Hospital Psychiatrico di Volterra. This abandoned lunatic asylum is located in Italy. All that's interesting says the asylum at Volterra was meant to be a sort of haven where patients could roam and do as they pleased. There were shops, a gardening company, and a judicial section which became known as the Fairy Pavilion. But the hospital's idyllic objective was sidelined after the facility became overcrowded. By the 1960s, the Hospital Psychiatrico di Volterra was one of the country's most populated hospitals with more than 6,000 patients. This was largely due to how easy it was to be committed to the hospital, and patients were admitted on the faintest signs of depression to accusations of moral transgressions. The facility was run like a prison, with nurses being referred to as guards or supervisors. Patients were treated like inmates and often sedated or isolated. The cures they were given included electroshock treatments, insulin-induced comas, and ice tank submersions. Patients at the Volterra facility suffered immensely until the hospital was abandoned in 1978 following the passage of the Basseglia Law, which mandated the closure of all mental hospitals in Italy. I didn't even know that ice tank submersions or insulin induced comas were a real thing. Like I just thought stuff like that existed in shows like Stranger Things, but that actually happened. Last I checked, an insulin induced coma isn't going to help anyone with schizophrenia. Number one on this list is the Willard Asylum. Once again guys, we have an asylum who initially wanted to help people but ended up doing the exact opposite. All that's interesting says, Willard was a state-of-the-art facility that featured a gymnasium, arts and craft classes, a movie theater, and even a bowling alley. It was meant to be a place where people living with mental illnesses could either devote themselves to their recovery or live in a safe and active environment. One of the hospital's main missions was to treat patients with the goal of preparing them to rejoin society. Despite this ideal, the hospital fell victim to the incomplete ideas and harsh treatments of its day. Patients were still subjected to electroshock therapy and ice baths, and some patients were kept at the asylum until their deaths. Many were buried under unmarked tombstones that still dot the abandoned asylum's grounds. The hospital was finally shut down in 1995. Perhaps most tragic about the asylum's history, however, was the discovery of hundreds of suitcases that were found catalogued in the hospital's attic upon its closure. These were the belongings of patients who died in the hospital and were unclaimed by next of kin. The staff was apparently unable to throw these mementos away. Hundreds of suitcases, guys. Not one or two or ten. Hundreds. That's hundreds of people who died here and were put in unmarked graves. Hundreds of people who died here and whose families either didn't care enough about them to go claim their belongings or were never informed that they died. I'm so happy that times have changed and the stigma around mental health and its treatment is lifting. A hundred years ago, the last thing you would have wanted is to have someone try and help you with whatever it is that you're dealing with. Number five on this list is the Beechworth Lunatic Asylum. Located in Australia, this is one of the most haunted asylums in the entire world. Thrillist says, formerly the Mayday Hills Lunatic Asylum, now La Trobe University's scenic Beechworth campus, this place saw 128 years of terror before closing in 1995. Apparently 9,000 patients died here over the years and people were so fast and loose with the term lunatic that few patients ever left the premises alive. It comes as no surprise that a few people lingered after death. Faces floating in windows are a common sight along with Matron Sharp doing her rounds and children laughing. Tommy Kennedy, who used to transport the dead out of the asylum and died there himself, still hangs around. There's also a woman who was thrown out of a window and died in front of the hospital because she was Jewish and the only person allowed to move her, a rabbi, couldn't make it to Beechworth sooner. Yeah, so clearly this place has seen its fair share of trauma throughout the years, folks. 9,000 people is a lot of people who have died. Like, we're talking about a small town's worth of human beings who died at this freaking asylum. And as exampled by that poor Jewish woman, these deaths weren't all from natural causes either. There was said to be some sick workers here. People who were twisted and got off on hurting others. People who worked at the asylum but probably would have been better suited to be in it themselves. 
Asylums in general are already susceptible to haunting considering what's going on, but when you have this amount of death and atrocities take place, it just makes it that much easier for ghosts and paranormal entities to cling on. Many of the locals don't even come close to this place anymore, and a lot of the tourists who do go here thoroughly regret that decision soon afterwards. These entities are angry and want to punish those who are living for what happened way back then. I don't recommend being one of the people who gets punished. Number 4 on this list is the Gonjiem Psychiatric Hospital. If you had a mental illness, then I promise you this is not where you wanted to end up. Thrillist says, believed to be one of the most haunted spots in South Korea, this abandoned psych hospital could be the basis for the next Stephen King novel based on its checkered history. According to local lore, patients here began dying mysterious deaths one after the other, forcing the facility to shut down. Many believe the murderous owners of the place was to blame, claiming that he kept patients as hostages only to flee to the states when families of the deceased demanded explanations. There are also rumors of doctors going insane, rivaling their patients in madness. So literally folks, if you ended up here, then there was a pretty good chance that not only did you not get the help that you needed, but you also just died. Whether this was because of the sick owners or the doctors, who even knows? That much death has left behind its mark though, and now this place looks like a safe haven for ghosts and everything paranormal. There's also been talk of a creature that lurks here, a creature that was actually the cause of all this death to begin with and is lurking, waiting for somebody to stop by and take them next. If I was you, I wouldn't want to be that person. In third place, we have the London Asylum for the Insane. So in 1870, London introduced its first asylum, and as one of the first institutions to treat mental illness in Ontario, Canada, it was, um, revolutionary. Hey, within days, their 500 beds were full. So it was located just outside of the city center, and the asylum initially focused on compassionate care and moral therapy. Their intent was to treat the patient as a whole being, rather than, you know, focusing on a single symptom. Patients would be bettered as members of society, fitting in with the community by keeping steady jobs and following strict social norms, thus, um, curing their mental illnesses. Now, while conforming to the ideals of conservative society sounds horrid to me, I do understand that at the time, it was probably a safe move. The world is a lot more forgiving now of individuality and understanding of differences, even though we still have a long way to go. So doctors at the asylum also performed several um, experimental surgeries. In fact, Dr. Richard Maurice Buck, who believed you know failed reproductive organs to be the source of mental illness or hysteria in women, executed routine hysterectomies. Moving into the 1930s, shock therapy was introduced to treat symptoms of schizophrenia by inducing seizures. Lobotomies were also completed between 1944 and 1967. While we don't know how many were performed in you know, London specifically, there are about a thousand between these 23 years across Ontario. One reason that someone would be sent to the asylum includes sexual deviation. What is, you know, shockingly expectant is that body self-love was identified as the root cause of a majority of mental illnesses. So Dr. Buck thought he had remedied this self-harm by inserting a metal wire into the foreskin of a man's penis so that the act would be too painful and uncomfortable. So what this doctor did not know is, you know, that self-love is actually a positive action for sexual health and is not the cause of mental illness, as he would later discover after 11 failed attempts of reversing what he did. What am I forgetting? I feel like there's something I haven't mentioned yet. Oh, right ghosts. There was a tree at the main door which was dead and black in color while vegetation was growing all around it and uh, oh that was the tree that patients ended their lives from. The chapel is known to be haunted with the temperature inside always feeling ice cold even though it might be sweltering hot outdoors and the recreation building has also been known to be the home of many unknown ghosts. But the one ghost you want to avoid is that of the bad doctor himself who passed away on the grounds in February of 1902 when he paused to gaze at the stars one winter's night and lost his balance and you know died from the resulting head injury. It's alleged that he was pushed by the ghost of one of his patients who had died from his morbid experimentation, but um, sadly the mortality rate, like I mentioned before, was so high that um, we don't know which patient it was. In second place we have the Topeka State Hospital. So according to the Topeka Capital Journal, a reporter visited the facility at some point during the early 20th century and saw a patient who had been strapped down for so long that his skin had begun to grow over his restraints. So according to my research, this would take many months, if not years to do so. So I am shuddering. Other patients were chained up while naked for months at a time. For many residents at that time, however, life offered a uh, different, similar sort of hell, even if they were unrestrained and unending boredom. Patients were given nothing to do, nothing to stimulate their minds, so they sat in rocking chairs in the hallway all day, rocking and staring and doing nothing else. Thankfully, in 1948, Kansas Governor Frank Carlson, responding to you know, reports of overcrowding and deplorable conditions, convened a panel to, you know, 
Study the problem. The state legislature ended up doubling the appropriations for mental hospitals, and the rocking chairs were removed from the hallway. However, the hospital lost its Medicare and Medicaid accreditation in 1988, and like so many hospitals, lost patients to community-based programs during the 1990s. In 1997, the year I was born, the hospital closed its doors for good. The ghosts that wander what's left of the hospital are those of former patients, which I know, I'm sounding like a broken record. Oh, there's a cemetery on the hospital grounds, which is, you know, the final resting place of patients who died in the hospital. Only 16 of the 1,157 graves have headstones, and most of the souls are left nameless. Visitors to the hospital grounds report seeing orbs and hearing strange moans coming from the cemetery. Yeah, no thank you. In first place, we have Century Manor. So built in 1884 on the outskirts of Hamilton, Ontario, Century Manor was the second major structural component of the Hamilton Asylum for the Insane, an institution initially established for the treatment of alcoholics. Newspaper articles published in the late 19th and early 20th centuries documented at least nine self-deaths committed in the building, as well as several attempts made by inmates who uh, escaped the hospital. Century Manor was also the scene of several strange accidents and horrific horrific crimes. One female patient fell to her death while attempting to, you know, escape out a window using a rope made from bedsheets, while another had her skull crushed by a falling elevator. One particularly troublesome male inmate was allegedly slugged to death by orderlies, while another split open the head of the asylum's head baker with an axe. No biggie, right? Apparently the living conditions were so bad that in 1910, a former inmate wrote a letter to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, saying that the place was an outrage to civilization. Let me... Allow me to read what he said. Wretched, vile torment is the order of the institutions. He had seen patients pounded, choked, insensible, time and time again, until redness would run from their nostrils. Oh, I haven't even gotten to the most dramatic tale yet. In the early morning hours of August 11th on 1911, a fire mysteriously broke out on the building's top floor. Firefighters who battled the blaze said that three of the inmates they rescued from the burning building broke away from them and leapt back into the inferno. When the embers finally cooled, firefighters found eight bodies amongst the ashes, including a paralytic who had burned to death in his cell, as well as five men huddled together in a small room. Burnt to a crisp. Now, the historic building shut its doors for good in 1995 and has sat empty ever since, serving as a haunting reminder of Hamilton's dark and tragic history. And now that we've got the history out of the way, time to talk about the ghosties, my favorite part. Underneath the property of Century Manor lies a system of old tunnels. This first-hand account comes from Jeff Cooper, who was hired to guard the entire West Fifth property overnight, and on one particular evening, he was making his rounds and ended up underground and inside the tunnels. He made a turn at one of the corners and found himself lost in a hallway with just one wooden door at the end. He heard voices coming from the other side of the door, so he walked up to it, quickly braced himself, took a few deep breaths, and swung the door open. There, sitting at a table in the middle of a small, dirty old room, were two women, dressed in old-fashioned nurses' uniforms. They both slowly turned and stared at him directly in the eye, until one of them spoke up and calmly said to the other, See? I told you he'd find us. The security guard was so frightened that he backed out of the room, slammed the door behind him, and caught his breath. He gathered his nerves a second time and slowly opened the door to a completely empty room. The nurses had disappeared from the room, with no other exits being apparent or visible. The ghosts of the men who lost their lives in the fire are also known to roam what's left of the establishment, so if any urban explorers smell smoke while they're there, don't say I didn't warn ya! Coming in at number 5, Paveglia Island, Italy. At first glance, Paveglia Island may seem like a picturesque Italian island. However, it is actually home to one of the scariest haunted hospitals in the world. For more than 100 years, beginning in 1776, the island was used as a quarantine station for those suffering from the plague and other diseases and later as a mental hospital. The hospital itself was an absolute nightmare, with one doctor in particular being known for performing cruel experiments on patients, oftentimes with no anesthetic, sanitization, or even respect for keeping the patients alive. Now, some reports say that Karma got to the doctor, and he in turn began to suffer from all the tortures of the dead, because he eventually flung himself from the hospital's bell tower, killing himself in hopes of freeing himself. The hospital was met by a lot of death, with it rumored that 50 percent of the soil there is human ash. As you would expect, the island is now home to some terrifying paranormal activity, with people risking their own safety to explore the abandoned hospital. But those that do often leave shaken, claiming they felt watched. Some even claim to have seen shadows that followed them around the place, heard voices, or seen things move by themselves. Very creepy indeed. Coming in at number four, Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, West Virginia. Also known as the Western State Hospital, this was a Kirkbride psychiatric hospital that was in operation between 1864 to 1994 in West Virginia. Now, this asylum, like the rest of our list, has quite the reputation due to the barbarism that took place at the hospital. Not to mention, it was also one of the most popular haunted hospitals in America for that very reason. Now, prior to the construction of the hospital, its grounds saw a lot of 
of bloodshed, with Civil War soldiers being killed on the grounds, even before the building was fully erected. Originally designed to house 250 patients in solitude, the hospital holds 717 patients by 1880, 1,661 in 1938, and over 1,800 in 1949. At its peak, 2,600 in the 1950s in overcrowded conditions. Trans Algaheni quickly became home to more violence than anyone could have ever imagined over the course of the next century. At the height of its use, the asylum became infamous for being home to staff abuse and having incredibly violent patients who were often left unattended. Now, it seems as though the former asylum has some ghostly residents, including that of a young girl named Lily, who died alone just wanting to play with someone. Another ghostly denizen is Ruth, a woman who was placed in Trans Algaheni due to being so violent. To this day, she still seems to have a vendetta against people, with many claiming to be attacked by unseen hands that allegedly are her own. Coming in number three, we've got Trans Allegheny. Overcrowding seems to be a universal problem when it comes to places meant for society's undesirables. We'll happily build a place to hide away folks who don't fit the mold, but then we decide there are more odd folks than ever and don't accommodate. It's a problem with prisons now and was a problem with mental asylums back in the day. Trans Allegheny is a particularly well-known haunted asylum for a multitude of reasons. This enormous building made out of hand-cut stone is something straight out of a nightmare. Urban explorers salivate at the thought of exploring a location like this, and for good reason. The asylum was built to house about 250 people. How many ended up crammed into the location, though? Take a wild guess. Go ahead. Are you locked in your answer? Good. They ended up funneling over 2,400 people here, over 10 times capacity. You can imagine how this went and what might have happened to those living in this overstuffed hellhole. And it wasn't just the overcrowding that caused problems. The staff here did all sorts of heinous things to the many folks stuck inside, often getting away with it because of the general namelessness of things in a 10 times capacity asylum. Ice pick lobotomies, rusty cages and chains, you name it. The result was despicable and years later we still see ghosts. Coming at number two, we've got the Danvers Lunatic Asylum. This one straight up looks like a haunted castle, which is a great start. The death, debauchery, and general disdain for human life and sanctity almost guarantees that it remains haunted too. Like most asylums, before the idea of mental health was really dreamt up, Danvers was a place of blood and brutality, abuse and archaic treatments, chaos and crisis. It opened with the intention of housing and treating mentally unstable criminals. Treatments back in the day were less than effective though. Shock Therapy and lobotomies were the favorites of doctors here, which, surprise, surprise, just hurt the criminals more. And after a while, it was decided that Danvers wouldn't just be a place for mentally unstable criminals. They'd toss anyone in there. This saw an influx of mentally stable felons, alcoholics, and handicapped folks, all to be treated the same as the folks who were there first. Uh oh. Nobody seemed to alter their methods to account for these new patients and inmates though, and the result was horrid. Eventually, the staff couldn't keep up with all the new people, and many people died. Some bodies were left to rot for extended periods of time because people passed away and nobody was looking for them. This, of course, led to all sorts of myths and legends about mysterious ghosts and spirits. Coming in at number one, we've got Nerenturm. Also known as the Fool's Tower, this cylindrical building in Vienna was once the earliest mental asylum in Europe. Here they kept all sorts of folks deemed unfit for public life, and doctors performed a plethora of experiments upon them. Over time, this use would be phased out and a new, interesting, and morbid purpose would be found. It now houses the Pathological Anatomical Museum educational and terrifying. See, the contents of this museum are gruesome, to say the least. They have a wide variety of physical abnormalities preserved in containers of formaldehyde. So if you ever wanted to see an abnormality hacked off a human and put into a jar like some sort of mad scientist hidden cellar, this is the place. They've also got a collection of replicas of body parts made out of wax. Doesn't sound like a horror movie in the making. So, from an asylum to a place displaying the most wild and weird ways the human body can become deformed, we've got it all at Naren Term. Not for the faint of heart or weak of stomach. Number 5 on this list is the Philadelphia State Hospital. This place is abandoned now, and based on the atrocities that happened here, that's for good reason. All that's interesting says, in the early 20th century, abuse against patients in these mental asylums was rampant, but few places were as violent as the Philadelphia State Hospital at Bybury, where multiple homicides were later uncovered. The facility opened in 1903 as a working farm for the mentally ill, and patients from other overcrowded mental health hospitals were sent there to heal. 
but the humble treatment facility quickly became overcrowded itself and was expanded into a multi-campus hospital. In 1919, two orderlies confessed to strangling a patient until his eyes popped out and then blamed their actions on PTSD from World War I. Despite their confession, the two orderlies were kept on staff and even given a pay raise. And this violence continued for years. In 1989, a groundskeeper stumbled upon the corpses of at least two other patients. Violence between patients was just as common. At least one staffer reported witnessing a patient stabbing another patient with a sharpened spoon in 1944. Unethical medical practices were also reportedly carried out in the now abandoned asylum. The pharmaceutical company Smith, Klein and French owned a lab at the hospital where they allegedly conducted questionable testing on patients, likely without their consent. They had people working here who literally murdered one of the patients and instead of doing anything about it, they just gave them a raise. These were different times back then folks and this asylum saw all the bad parts of this era. This murder happened all the way back in 1919 and this hospital kept running like this all the way until 1990. 1990 isn't that long ago guys. We are only a few decades removed from this horrible institution operating. And the crazy part about all of this is that a place like this is meant to help people. What a joke that ended up being. Number four on this list is the Beechworth Asylum. This asylum has definitely been talked about on this channel before in relation to haunted asylums. All That's Interesting says, in October 1867, the sprawling Beechworth Lunatic Asylum was opened in Australia. The facility was built on a hill due to the erroneous belief at the time that high altitude could cleanse patients of their mental illnesses. As was typical of early institutions, the abandoned asylum took in a massive number of patients. At its peak, it housed about 1,200 patients and employed 700 staff members. Also, like most facilities of the 19th century, the treatments at Beechworth were notoriously violent. Doctors subjected patients to straitjackets and shackles. Electroshock treatments were common practice there, so much so that they were reportedly mass shock sessions where nearly the entire patient population was shocked simultaneously. Given the extent of the mistreatment that took place at the asylum, it may not come as a surprise that the facility, which was finally closed in 1995, is said to be extremely haunted. Those who worked at the hospital during its last years alleged that the hauntings began long before the hospital was shuttered. The most famous ghost who's seen these days is Matron Sharp. She was said to watch over the patients as they were shocked by the other nurses and doctors. If you ever saw her coming to your room, then there was a good chance the shock therapy was coming for you next. Now you can sense her due to a dramatic cold presence that fills the room. Number three on this list is Lear Sikanus. With a name like that, you can just assume that it's going to be haunted. Thrillist says about a half hour from Oslo, this asylum was opened in 1926 and today is considered one of the most haunted hotspots in the country. Despite its reputation and the fact that most of the place has been abandoned since 1985, parts of it still house psychiatric patients who share their space with ghosts, shadows, and odd noises. Between 1945 and 1974, the hospital was notorious for conducting experiments on its patients, especially the testing of new drugs that even the pharmaceutical industry was hesitant to try on humans. I don't know where and when people thought that testing already mentally sick people with questionable drugs was a good idea. It seems like this is something that happened a ton in history and I have no idea how anyone thought this was a good idea. Like first off, they're already sick and going through something so it just doesn't make sense how feeding them something that we know nothing about is going to give the desired result. 
The people who used to do this had to know it was wrong because the patients at this hospital weren't really given any choice in the matter. They were forced to go through these experiments which often resulted in permanent damage to their bodies if not death. Those who had to go here from the 40s to the 70s literally could not leave. They were stuck here and they just had to pray that they didn't get the worst of the experiments. Thank your lucky stars that you didn't have to go to this place during this time or you would never be able to get out. Number 2 on this list is the Pool Park Asylum. This asylum in Wales has been abandoned for over three decades now. Atlas Obscura says, like any good abandoned asylum, damp, dilapidated, and deathly silent. The estate of Pool Park began as a deer park for the nearby Ruthen Castle. Following its time as a hunting ground, the property was passed between a series of wealthy landowners. The elegant mock Tudor style manor house that still stands today was constructed in 1862 for the second Lord Bagot. In 1937, the house was sold to the North Wales County's Mental Hospital, which was in need of a second location to house overflow patients from the nearby Denby Insane Asylum. Pool Park held 87 patients at capacity, but in times of need, had as many as 120. For a brief stint of time during World War II, the grounds also held a prisoner of war camp. Today, the solid wooden floors and intricate wood paneling have rotted due to water damage. The house has been looted for lead and copper and its ceilings are dripping water and shedding plaster. You'll be hard pressed to find an intact window. This was a smaller asylum than some of the other ones on this list, but don't take that to mean that it wasn't as bad or brutal. People suffered here, just as much as in the bigger asylums. It was just a bit more personal here considering there weren't that many people. It also wasn't just mental patients who suffered, but as you can probably imagine, the prisoners of war didn't fare too well either. There were definitely a few disappearances, if you will, during that time of the asylum's life. Now, people are free to come and go as you wish, considering the asylum is abandoned, but there are a few ghosts that are fully trapped here. These ghosts are of mental patients and war vets alike, and they are forever bonded to this place, forced to live in this horrible purgatory. You probably don't want to visit this place for fear that they could keep you there with them. And finally, number one on this list is the Creedmoor Psychiatric Center Building 25. High probability that if you got sent to this place, then you are never getting out again. Atlas Obscura says, opened in 1912, Creedmoor State Hospital was initially the farm colony of Brooklyn State Hospital, now Kingsborough, with 32 patients who worked the farmland as part of their treatment. Like many other similar institutions, over the first half of the 20th century, the population at Creedmoor rapidly expanded before deinstitutionalization occurred beginning in the 1950s, at which point the hospital shrank from 8,000 to 500 patients in the span of only four decades. The 1970s were a rough time for the hospital when crime infested the campus. Three assaults, 22 violent assaults, 52 fires, 130 burglaries, 6 people taking their own life, a shooting, and a riot occurred within 20 months of each other. It was around this time that Building 25 was abandoned. Never sold off or demolished, it has been rotting on the hospital grounds since it was vacated in the early 1970s. Yeah, so with everything that went down here, I think it's pretty clear that if you got sent here, odds were not in your favor. These were all things that happened outside of the asylum too. Inside the asylum with the patients and everything, you had the same sick experiments and treatments going down as some of the other ones on this list. Thank goodness it closed down and it isn't operating anymore. In fifth place, we have Nocton Hall Hospital. So it was built in 1530 and originally meant for residential use, but served as a hospital for American officers who were injured in World War I. It was used once more as a military hospital during World War II and has been used in a similar capacity ever since, but no more. In the 1980s, it was once again put to private use, but by the 1990s, a significant fire had rendered it unhabitable. Time for the dark stuff. It's alleged that one of the male owners of the home sexually took advantage of and uh, killed a young girl. Today her presence has been reported by various people who were in the building. Many people claim to have seen the ghostly image appearing at exactly 4.30 a.m. since she's fond of standing at the end of staff members beds in the middle of the night. Interesting that she chooses the 4 a.m. hour to appear since 3 a.m. is usually the like preferred time for spirits since that's when the veil between our world and theirs is the thinnest. So this spirit has been blamed for the disembodied sound of sobbing 
clothing around the building. The building is also said to have a resident gray lady, but information around her is a lot harder to find, so let me know in the comments if, you know, there's any experts out there, because any ghostie with a missing story is super intriguing to me. In fourth place, we have the Trenton State Hospital, originally known as the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum, later Trenton State, and now Trenton Psychiatric Hospital. It was the very first one founded on the Kirkbride Plan by activist Dorothea Dix, but it's more remembered for, you know, its medical no-nos instead of its well-intentioned beginnings. Dr. Henry Cotton became the director of the hospital in 1907 and instituted treatments based on his own theories of mental illness. On the one hand, Henry, who had trained at John Hopkins under the the eminent Swiss-born psychiatrist Adolf Mayer had a very progressive attitude towards care for his patients. He did away with the mechanical restraints that so many other hospitals used to control patients, introduced occupational therapy, increased the staff, and ensured that the nurses would prevent violence against the patients, and instituted daily staff meetings about patient care. But Henry developed a dangerous theory about mental illness, one that turned his hospital into a house of horrors. After it was confirmed in 1913 that the spirochete that caused syphilis can cause the disease's psychiatric symptoms, Henry began to to suspect that all mental illness was caused by bodily infections, and that the only way to cure the patient was to remove the offending infection. In 1917, he began removing his patient's teeth, even in cases where x-rays showed no evidence of infection. Ow! He soon moved on to the other body parts, gallbladder, stomachs, ovaries, testicles, tracts of colon, uteruses. Henry claimed a cure rate of 85%, but in reality, his surgeries had an unconsciously high mortality rate, and he didn't always obtain consent from the patients or their family members, and in fact, sometimes performed these removals despite their protests. And hey, if that isn't icky enough, he wasn't quiet at all about what he was doing. The crazy doctor published papers and gave presentations on his work. When Mayer, Henry's mentor, sent you know, another psychiatrist to report on the operations at Trenton State, he initially suppressed the report, allowing Henry to continue continue his gruesome work. He remained at Trenton until 1930, three years before his death. Now, the tooth pulling practice remained in place until 1960, and my mouth hurts thinking about it. Before I get nightmares, Time to move on to the fun stuff. As for the ghosts themselves, they are thought to all be those of patients that died within the building. But the most well-known ghost is that of Dr. Henry himself, who has been seen wearing a white doctor's coat and walking down the corridor in the area outside his office. The most commonly reported phenomenon at the hospital is that of disembodied voices, mainly muffled screams and moans coming from distant rooms. Orbs can be caught throughout the building at any time of the day, with some having a strong pale blue glow to them. There are also tales of seeing the ghosts of patients with arms and legs missing, who have been seen in some of the rooms upon, you know, somebody entering them, only to fade away after a few seconds. See, the ghost of patients I'd love to see, but I feel like seeing Henry would terrify me for a while now that I know, you know, what he did in his lifetime. A lovely example of why to not enable people who do bad things. Number three, Rolling Hills Asylum. Located in Bethany, New York, Rolling Hills Asylum was established in 1826 as a poor farm or poor house which was an institution built by the government to house and maintain orphans, widowed women, the disabled, the mentally ill, and of course, children. The staff did their best to keep unsafe patients away from the general population, but problems soon ensued. As a result, a solitary confinement cell was constructed in the building, and those who lived there were often referred to as, quote, the inmates. In 2008, Carrie Kearns, the co-founder of Ghost Hunting Sea Pier, did an overnight public ghost hunt at Rolling Hills. Arriving around 4 p.m., we went to Rolling Hills to get some pictures during the day. The doors opened for the public ghost hunt at 9.30. There were said to be 50 people present during the ghost hunt, and there were two tour groups. We used devices such as digital audio recorders, video recorders with night vision, thermometer gauge EMFs, flash cameras, the works. A ghost box and sound amplifier were also present. We did catch some orbs in many pictures, with some being more impressive than others. What appears to be a mist or a smog coming out from behind the nurse's station door scared us. On film, on the second floor, doors of the solarium move on their own. Even shadows of people standing and walking behind the doors appeared. We also caught some EVPs with our digital audio recorders, with a voice of what sounds like an elderly lady screaming, quote, you, go away. When in the electrotherapy room, I had two episodes of sharp pain that lasted approximately one minute to the left side of my head and right above my eye. Twice in the electrotherapy room. Around 4 a.m., Mike and I traveled from the area of the organ room down to the second hallway and sat against the sides of the hall. While Mike and I sat there, I began to feel something touch and crawl up my right leg. As that happened, another shadow peeking from around the corner of one of the doors made us super uncomfortable. It was just staring at us. While investigating on the third floor, there were sounds of someone walking around. I felt the touch of a hand touch my face and a couple seconds later, one of the other investigators further down the hallway said she felt something holding her hand squeezing hard. I wonder what this mist was. Sounds like some Ghostbusters plasma right there. 
Number two, Penhurst Asylum. In October 2019, Ripley's, believe it or not, spent a night at one of the most chilling and gruesome asylums that ever stood. Penhurst Asylum in Pennsylvania has been called many things. Ghost Ward, the crazy kids, and of course, one of the most haunted asylums on earth. The team spent a night and had this to say about its history and their experiences. Penhurst's long history of misconduct of children, for example, used punishments such as the removal of children's teeth if they were labeled a biter. The employee's cruelty has been well documented over the years and is that of Dr. Jesse G. Fear, literally the worst name for a doctor. Chris Levine, an open-minded skeptic and Flip Searless, team leader, were just a few of the crew who spent the night with a variety of audio recording devices. Apparently the Echo Vox, which is a tool for investigators, started playing kids jingles. Quote, we were getting a lot of different children's songs, but the one on repeat was Pop Goes the Weasel. It was pretty terrifying because we heard kids singing along with the Echo Vox in the background. Flip had asked, can you see us? And the children's voice on the spirit box came back and said, yes. How do you see us? And the kid's voice said, as ghosts. As we head down into the basement, a prominent ghostly figure is waiting for us. The King. A menacing figure popular with the paranormal enthusiasts who visited Penhurst over her years. The King was a maintenance worker here from the 40s. His domain? The boiler room. He was not well and he was known to treat the patients cruelly. He's known to come across on EVPs as a large shadowy figure creeping around corners and he'll even touch you. Though they're uncertain if he's a poltergeist or demonic entity, he's come across with a creepy laugh. He told us his name and the crew even had a full conversation with him. After listening to the ghost box recording, the team were nervous when they heard the king yelling, leave, leave, leave. We started on the right foot because I offered him a cigarette and asked him if he wanted to smoke. He said yes. Fast forward 10 minutes and he clearly did not want us in that room. He would just repeatedly yell, leave. That's horrifying. After asking what would happen if we didn't leave, the king's voice screamed, choke. Spooky. Okay. And coming in at number one, Waverly Hills. Opened in 1910 in Louisville, Kentucky as a two-story hospital to accommodate 40 to 50 tuberculosis patients, Waverly Hills earns its gruesome history from its tortured patients, ghastly medical experiments, and the infamous body slide, aka body shoot, aka the death tunnel, where the dead were transported down and collected at the bottom by a group of staff who would collect them to be cremated or buried. A true ghost tale has featured numerous stories by visitors to Waverly Hill Sanatorium. In one of these cases, an experience was of Mary Lee. She was a young woman who lived in the sanatorium while it was open. On September 10th, 2006, Tom Halstead of Missouri Paranormal Research took a photograph of a ghostly apparition that looked almost exactly like Mary. Some believe Mary is the nurse who hung herself in the haunted room 502, while others believe she contracted tuberculosis herself from a prolonged exposure to patients due to the sounds that they hear, mostly coughs. Whoever this mysterious woman is, she's been captured and feared for decades. Doppelgangers, also known as double walkers, are a type of spirit that mimic the appearance, voice, and mannerisms of anyone it encounters. At Waverly Hills, looking across the room and seeing the exact replica of yourself is pretty common. Even tour guides at Waverly Hills have reported seeing doppelgangers of themselves. And in some cases, the doppelgangers were almost identical except for gaping black holes where the eyes should be. Probably the most famous spirit at Waverly Hills is a little boy known as Timmy. Timmy was around six years old when he died in the hospital. Since he died with his whole life ahead of him, his spirit can't move on and he wanders the hospital in search of life. Visitors often bring toys or bring small balls for him to play with. And many claim that they see the balls bouncing on their own, slamming against the walls, or are whipped at high speed down the hallways. One thing's for certain, this place is one of the most haunted. Coming in at number five, we've got Gongium Asylum. Like many famously haunted places, this one is scary and well known enough to spawn a feature film, and a pretty darn good one too. Like legitimately scary with plenty of twists and a wicked premise. But beyond the scary flick, which is a whole lot of movie magic and quality pacing, we've got an actual ghost story to look at. Many believe this asylum to be one of the most haunted locations in South Korea, and it attracts all sorts of thrill seekers. Let's just hope their stories end up a little better than those in the movie, right? No guarantees. 
The tales surrounding this abandoned hospital are varied and plentiful, painting many a vivid picture of doom and terror. Most of the time, they don't really line up with each other either. This hasn't stopped rumors from proliferating though. If anything, the huge spread of stories and legends have increased Ganjium's notoriety. The most common thing to hear about is that its patients started dying mysterious deaths one day, and the number of fatalities rose quite quickly. Nobody could explain why this was the case unless they were paranormal deaths. Terrible treatment and tragic deaths leading to the creation of ghosts, phantoms, and demons. The imbuing of a dark, evil energy at the place where so many had lost their minds and lives. As time went on, more stories escaped the facility, including the owner of the asylum being a murderous psychopath himself. He would keep people there against their will, regardless of whether their treatment was working or not. From time to time, this owner would kill a patient just for fun while keeping the others to be tortured. Only those who made daring escapes would survive to tell this story. Then there were whispers of doctors becoming just as unhinged as their patients, performing dangerous experiments and doing horrible things to those in their care. The more things became unhinged, the more cursed energy seemed to collect in the building. Now, if we're being honest, the real reason the asylum shut down has nothing to do with these activities, although a sewage problem could be a convenient cover-up for all the insanity behind closed doors. Coming in number 4, we've got the Rolling Hills Asylum. Sounds really pleasant and picturesque, right? Rolling hills evoke an image of calm, breezy stretches of road, some tall grass blowing in the wind, yeah? Well, that might be how they sold this asylum to prospective patients and their families, but the reality of life here is far from the pastoral charm implied by the name. And it didn't really start in an asylum either. It was more of a place for all sorts of unsavory characters to be collected to ensure they didn't cause any problems for more upstanding members of society. Definitely not a way for the rich to put all the people they didn't want to think about in one convenient location away. Of course, when you put all sorts of poor, sick, and mentally ill people in a cramped place and just sort of leave them there, things don't improve at a great speed. The opposite, if you can believe it. There were almost 2,000 recorded deaths here, but that does seem to be a bit of an underestimate. As is the case with plenty of spots like this, all sorts of undocumented deaths did occur, and it's said that there are hundreds of unmarked and unaccounted for graves on the site. The result of all this death, overcrowding, and lunacy is a legacy of ghosts and demons. Rolling Hills is well known for paranormal activity these days and attracts a fair deal of enthusiasts quite often. In fact, there are all sorts of ghost tours offered to those who don't think sneaking into a haunted asylum is a good idea. People have reported hearing blood-curdling screams throughout the location and have seen doors slam without anyone around to do so. There's also the famed Shadow Hallway, a stretch of corridor that is said to host a whole squad of shadowy apparitions. Walking down this hall, you might see a figure peeking out from around the corner, or maybe you'll witness a looming presence gliding along, looking for something it'll never find. And who could forget dear Roy Krause, the tallest ghost most folks have ever seen? He lived his life as a 7 foot 5 phenom, and now his phantom stands just as tall. Coming in at number three, we have Severals Hospital, England. Severals Hospital is a former psychiatric hospital located in Colchester, Essex formerly managed by the North Essex Partnership University NHS Foundation Trust. It quickly became one of the scariest and most haunted hospitals in the entire world. Now, for a period of time, this was the leading hospital for electroshock therapies, as well as lobotomies in all of the UK. In the 1950s, psychiatrists experimented with new treatments on patients, now considered unsuitable, such as the use of frontal lobotomy. Many of the patients housed at Severals Hospital weren't even mentally ill, yet were still given these barbaric treatments treatments. In fact, in some of the records, patients range from women who gave birth out of wedlock to moody teenagers. Following the treatments, many people were never the same, with some even passing away during the stay at their hospital. During World War II, the hospital was severely affected due to bombs being dropped by Germany, resulting in 38 women being killed, with many more injured. Now the hospital is closed, however, people that visit the grounds often report a very deep sense of fear, sorrow, and even mourning. Some visitors have even reported to see shadow people lurking in the corners of some of the rooms. As of today, the hospital is no longer open to visitors, with it remaining completely abandoned. However, some urban explorers still roam the remains to see if the hauntings are true. Coming in at number two, we have Waverly Hills Sanitarium, Kentucky. 
Very few hospitals have as dark a past as Waverly Hill Sanitarium, making it one of the scariest hospitals, not just in the United States, but in the entire world. Now closed, the Waverly Hill Sanitarium is located in Louisville, Kentucky, with the opening as a two-story hospital in 1910 to accommodate 40 to 50 tuberculosis patients. However, in the early 1900s, Jefferson County was struck by an outbreak of tuberculosis, which prompted the construction of a new hospital. However, some of the treatments they offered for tuberculosis included fresh air exposure, even during the winter. Other treatments included ballooning the lungs or even removing a lung entirely. As you would imagine, these treatments didn't have a high success rate, resulting in a large amount of deaths and a reputation for being a place where no one is left alive. Now, according to some reports, the deaths grew so rapidly the hospital was forced to create an underground tunnel in order to cart the bodies out without having patients see them. The tunnel was an entrance and exit for the workers of the sanitarium. It was built on the first floor with the rest of the building. They did this to increase morale as patients were finding it a little upsetting to see deceased patients be carted away, so the hospital decided to perform those acts more discreetly via the tunnel. They also believed that this would help lower the disease's spreading rate. Now, once TB rates began to die down, the sanitarium became a mental hospital that quickly became overcrowded. Patients would often undergo treatment such as lobotomy, not to mention experimental procedures and physical abuse by staff. These days, it is known as one of the most haunted hospitals in the world, which houses the room where a nurse killed herself after finding out she was pregnant with the doctor's baby. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Edgeworth Lunatic Asylum, Australia. Australia is filled to the brim with terrifying wildlife that could, on any given day, potentially kill you. So saying that, it might not come as much of a surprise to know that Australia has some equally as terrifying hospitals, including Beechworth Lunatic Asylum. Originally known as Beechworth Asylum, this is a decommissioned hospital in the town of Victoria, Australia. It ultimately closed in 1995 after 128 years of operation. For those 128 years, Beechworth Asylum was home to some of Australia's most violent criminals. It was also notorious for its abusive staff members, as well as for a number of unexplained disappearances. It is said that Beechworth conducted some of the typical medical treatments of that time, including straitjackets, restraint chairs, and isolation cages, all of which were standard forms of treatment for those suffering from mental illness. Now, all it took to land you in Beechworth Asylum was a couple of signatures, one from a friend or relative, and the other from a doctor. So saying that, it was easy for people to get rid of husbands or wives that they didn't want around anymore. Now, with such a troubled past, it will come as no surprise Surprised to learn that Beechworth is haunted, with one sighting involving the ghost of a nurse, Matron Sharp, who was said to wander the halls of the asylum, presenting a comforting presence. One of the cruelest aspects of Beechworth was what is known as Ha Ha Walls. Now, the key feature of these walls was a trench built on the interior of the asylum's walls. Now, this in turn made the wall appear low enough that it seemed that the inmates weren't actually imprisoned, whereas on the inside it ensured that none of them could actually escape. Number five on this list is the Royal. Rolling Hills Asylum. Located in East Bethany, New York, this asylum will suck you in and never let you out. Thrillist says, more a stockpile of outcasts, the poor, the widowed, the orphaned, the handicapped, the criminal, the alcoholic, than an insane asylum per se. The former Genesee County Poor House, established in 1827, counts over 1,700 documented deaths. Some are convinced that's a lowball number and hundreds more were buried on the property in unmarked graves. Paranormal activity in the 53,000 square foot building includes screaming, doors slamming, and apparitions, most famously of Roy Cruz, a seven and a half foot giant who died there in 1942. There's also something known as the Shadow Hallway, so named because of the shadowy apparitions that peek out from doors or shuffle and crawl across the corridor. A variety of ghost tours are available. These shadow creatures, the ones that pass through the shadow hallways, they apparently aren't the friendliest of creatures from what I've heard. Lots of people who have gone into this place never make it out again. It's thought that this is the work of the shadow creatures here. Then the person who is sucked in by those creatures becomes one of the shadow creatures there as well. Meaning that this asylum is slowly growing in its sinister and evil presence. 
Who was the initial shadow creature and why these beings have manifested here is unknown. All we know now is that they are here and they are here to stay, which ultimately means that you need to stay away. Number 4 on this list is Narenturm. So this is a weird and unique one for sure. It actually isn't an asylum anymore and it's also not abandoned which makes it pretty unique for a list like this. Currently it actually serves as a museum believe it or not. Thrillist says it's unclear what's worse, the surely morbid history that took place in Vienna's Fool Tower, Europe's first insane asylum built in 1784, or its current use, the anatomical pathological museum which features more than 4,000 graphic, gruesome abnormalities, jars full of deformed fetuses and sickening wax models of untreated STDs. Either way, there's enough nightmare fuel in this place to last you until next Halloween. Nightmare fuel is an excellent way to describe this place. It's messed up for sure guys. I don't know if you're going to get into a position where you won't be able to leave this place, but you definitely will be feeling weird for sure based on what you're looking at. Untreated STDs and deformed fetuses. No thank you. Not to mention this place might actually be haunted. This was the first insane asylum ever in Europe guys. Just think about what the conditions would have been like. Conditions in mental hospitals today are still not super ideal, but back then you would have been treated horribly. Back then they would have treated you worse than a criminal and probably tortured you until you couldn't take it anymore. There are reports from olden asylums where they would just shove people into tiny little boxes and keep them there for days. Obviously the people who had to go through this, their spirits have never been able to rest or find peace. So along with the STDs you might also get haunted as well. Great place this is. In third place we have the case of Purple Scrubs. Former EMT David O'Keefe worked mainly in transfers and this particular client was always his last one of the day, having to return home late at night in the dark. She was an older woman who visited the hospital he was based out of for regular dialysis treatment. One specific day she was being moved and David was sitting in the back of the transport vehicle with her. She looked under the weather so he asked what was wrong out of concern and she said a man in purple had been visiting her. He asked if the man was you know like a relative or a technician. But she shook her head. She said the man would sit next to her during dialysis appointments and stroke her hair. Thinking this was strange, right after he dropped her off at the hospital, David asked the hospital techs about you know such a person, but no one had seen or remembered anyone wearing purple. Visitors also weren't really a thing at this part of the hospital, so he assumed the patient was just imagining it. While he was waiting to bring her back home, he saw the man in purple scrubs waiting outside that woman's room, watching her door. As David went to approach him, a bunch of tech personnel urgently ran past them into the woman's room and David lost sight of the man. It turned out the woman in the room had suffered a heart attack and was sadly unable to be revived. Oh and just a like tiny creepy footnote, none of the staff in that hospital wore purple scrubs. In second place we have a mystery mimic. Yeah I'm fond of alliteration, how can you tell? This spooky story comes to us courtesy of former late night transportation worker Betty. She worked the position for a few years but after this incident did everything possible to never work a nighttime shift ever again. The transport home base was in the basement of the hospital where all laundry was done and all supplies were sorted and housed. On this particular night, Betty was the only one in the basement when she heard whistling at the end of the hallway by the elevator and poked her head around the corner expecting to see her only co-worker on duty that night, but there was absolutely no one there. And so she shrugged it off. That night in particular was slower in pace, so she opted to take a snack break and veg in the break room for a bed. When she heard a loud bang out of nowhere, Betty walked into the hallway and a bed was rolling down the hall bumping into the sides of the walls. Now at this point she assumed that her coworker was playing a prank on her and she directly radioed him to chew him out but he swore he was upstairs. Honestly, I'd be assuming the same. I've had a similar situation in a haunted house I used to work in at an old theater, but Betty was smart about it and determined to catch her coworker in the act. She started walking down the hallway and as she passed the laundry room, all the machines started up. She poked her head in, expecting to find him, but the room was completely empty. Just a tiny worrisome spooky flag, nothing to worry about right? As she walked into the laundry room, the machines came to a complete stop. Betty froze at first before regaining her senses and making her way towards the elevator when she heard whistling from the other end of the hall. Now at this point she's certain that she's the only worker in the basement and is repeatedly pressing the elevator buttons in an attempt to like rush it. As she was waiting for the elevator, things started falling off the shelves down the hall. 
Betty could only stare in shock as boxes of gloves, tissues, and packages of tubes fell off various racks one by one. Her entire body broke out in goosebumps, every hair standing on its end, and the feeling of being watched had completely consumed her thoughts. When the elevator finally arrived after what seemed like forever, Betty felt the sensation of someone brushing her arm and screamed in panic. Upon exiting the elevator upstairs, she made a beeline for the cafeteria, where her coworker actually was, and broke down explaining the entire ordeal. Now, before y'all ask, but Alexa, how was this spirit a mimic? Turns out that Betty usually whistles to herself at work at night, chats with the laundry folks during daytime shifts, and the items that fell off the shelf slowly were common items that she would have to retrieve. Yeah, big note for me on this one. In first place, we have terrified security staff. Security guard Mason claims that while he wants his location to stay anonymous, he used to work overnight security in one of the largest, best, and oldest hospitals in the USA. He and his fellow security officers all have stories about one building in particular, which was built in the late 1800s and was the original psychiatric building for this hospital. Now, being the late 1800s, not much was truly known about psychiatric disorders at that time. On top of that, this hospital was known for its medical research. Sadly, with what we all know about history, when you combine the two, that spells out a lot of nightmares. A couple years before Mason started working security there, this building in particular had been converted partially into offices after the newly built part of the hospital had dedicated a section for the updated psych ward. Mason's rounds for the first night of our tale happened to include, yep, you guessed it, that building. At night, this building was empty due to most of the staff who worked in those offices leaving by 5 p.m. every day. Apparently some folks like to rush home, which is fair, but they would leave their office doors unlocked, which was a big no-no due to medical information being located in their offices. Big confidential stuff. I don't want to keep that locked up. It was security's job to go to each floor, make sure every door was locked, and if it wasn't, to secure themselves. Mason did his initial sweep of the building to make sure it was clear of people, and then proceeded to do door checks. The hallways were pretty narrow, so he could check both sides of the hallway's doors at once. At the end of this hallway, there were two sets of doors you had to go through to reach the final office, which was a dead end, so you had to come back out, go the other way. He noticed everything was secure, so he was ready to move on to the next floor. He exited the two sets of doors from the dead end office and froze at what he saw. Every door that he had already checked was completely ajar and set so perfectly so that their own weight wouldn't cause them to shut again. A single wheelchair had appeared at the end of the hallway and was facing towards the steps. Mason had heard other security officers outright reject that set of rounds due to the strange stuff that was happening, but he originally laughed it off until that night. He went around and forced the now open door shut and tried to shrug it off. Nothing else weird happened that night and he returned the next night to patrol the miners ward. The area was just under construction, so security was needed to make sure nobody got hurt by accident and all the workers were doing their job. Safety first. When Mason was hanging out in the break room before his shift officially started, other security guards were discussing various reports of seeing a young human with brown hair who would disappear randomly, and Mason dismissed this as just gossip meant to spook off the newbies. An hour into making his rounds, a foreman who had stayed late called security and asked for a security officer to come up because, quote, a youngin with brown hair had locked himself in a room and he didn't want him to get hurt with all the open wires in there. Mason answered the call, went and unlocked the door for the foreman, and looked in a 20 by 8 room for about 10 minutes, and upon seeing no one, called it in as a false alarm. He attempted to shrug it off until he received a call for backup in the psych ward, and when he arrived he noticed the patient was in a state of panic near the remnants of a shattered chandelier. Now, before he had experienced the abnormal happenings in this building, Mason claims he would have written off his testimony as idiocy. But the patient claimed that something held him in that spot as the chandelier started swinging wildly until it started to fall. When it started to fall, he was let go and allowed to move and scrambled out of the way before it hit him. Now, this was the beginning of the end for Mason, who requested to be transferred to hospitals the next day. And as much as I love the Phantom of the Opera, I don't really want it to become reality. One of my favorite things to say in accordance with that is that I love one fictional toxic tenor, and only one. Emphasis on fictional. Number five, the Trans Allegheny Asylum. Built in the Civil War era in West Virginia, this asylum was designed to house around 250 patients, but ended up housing more than 2,500 people. People locked in cages, lobotomized with ice picks, tied to the beds. It's safe to say that this place is a nightmare in itself. Since the asylum was briefly a Civil War military base and absolutely haunted to the core, people have spotted uniformed soldier ghosts strolling the corridors. Patients were previously admitted into the asylum for a variety of reasons, including asthma, laziness, egotism, and even greediness. 
this was a different time. This led to more and more patients being admitted, causing the asylum to overflow with staff and bedding. It is said that the most famous ghost is the presence of a small girl named Lily. She was either a former patient or a child of one of the housing staff or patients. Back then it was very common for women to be admitted while pregnant. One thing's for sure, she spent her childhood and her afterlife stuck within these walls. Ghost hunters make contact with her spirit all the time apparently. Staff members say that there are always toys strewn out on the fourth floor and Lily's been known to move them around herself. Small balls rolling down the hallway on their own, running footsteps and voices can be heard playing with things on the floor. Lily is known for her loud laughter, as well as her interest in playing games with staff and visitors. Other experiences include dark shadows, objects moving on their own, disembodied voices and cries. This place is haunted haunted. Today the asylum is used as a historic and ghostly tour hotspot in which haunting stories combined with the decaying look of the structure creates the contrast that the asylum is well known for. The asylum itself was created with good intentions, it was meant to treat people who need to care, but soon it became misused and the people in originally meant to care for were horribly. After closing its doors for good in 1994, they reopened to educate and tell the tales of the patients themselves who lived and died within these walls. Number 4. Danvers State Hospital Located about 21 miles north of Boston, the hospital opened on May 1st, 1878 and the hospital's first patients arrived only days later. The inspiration for H.P. Lovecraft and Batman's Arkham Asylum due to its gothic look and its twisted patience. This asylum followed in the same footsteps of any classic mental asylum. It was only meant for about 500 patients but ended up housing around 2,500. Low staff, no rooms, and of course treatments such as shock therapy and lobotomies. This asylum was the very first to operate the transorbital lobotomy where an ice pick is inserted through the eye socket and into the brain. Ouch. The staff started to experiment with this new method on the elderly, mentally disabled, alcoholics, drug addicts, and insane criminals. The staff used treatments like shock therapy and lobotomies even when they didn't need to. Of course, due to the extreme methods of controlling patients and the push for science, patients started dying there, and their bodies were found days and months later. The cruelty just began. The doctors were using lobotomies to cure anything from daydreaming and backaches to delusions and depression. Visitors described how dirty the patients always looked, how they were creepily wandering the halls and sometimes even blankly staring off into space. Some of these patients weren't even suffering from anything, and the extremes of the treatments are what drove them insane. The asylum was of course shut down and its building demolished. Some patients left the asylum while others are spending eternity under its grounds. The asylum's buildings don't exist anymore, but its cemetery does. Danvers State Hospital closed on June 24, 1992 due to budget cuts within the mental health system. And the 770 patients who died at Danvers were buried in the numbered lots on the property with the hospital replacing traditional headstones with patient numbers. This is just one act of cruelty and dehumanization the hospital was known for. Number three on this list is the Trans Algony Lunatic Asylum. This is a scary masterpiece, folks. Thrillist says, This impressive structure, allegedly the world's second largest hand-cut stone masonry building after the Kremlin, looks like it was designed as the set of a blockbuster thriller. Built around the Civil War era, the asylum was designed to house around 250 patients but ended up holding more than 2400 including for a brief period the infamous Charles Manson. That's the opposite of a celebrity endorsement. Along with severe overcrowding, profound abuse abounded people were locked in cages, lobotomized with ice picks, chained to things and the combination led to hundreds of deaths and a palpable air of suffering. Apparitions are a plenty, like the still deranged patient Ruth who likes to attack visitors. And since the asylum was also briefly a Civil War military base, uniformed soldier ghosts roam the halls. Thousands have claimed to hear voices telling them to get out. Civil War themed ghost tours, tours of the medical center, forensic buildings and geriatrics buildings, and zombie events and balls fully play up the twisted history on the campus grounds. Now, don't get me wrong, would it be really fun to be part of a zombie event at this place? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm also not trying to get attacked by Ruth, the deranged ghost patient. Whenever people travel to a place like this, there is a risk involved. I personally am not willing to take the risk based on the history that this place has seen. Comment down below if you would. 
Number two on this list is Danfer's Lunatic Asylum. This asylum hosted a very select group, criminals. Thrillist says, part prison, part asylum, all terror. This gothic monolith opened in 1878 to house mentally unstable criminals. Thanks to the addition of the mentally handicapped, alcoholics, and plain old felons, it became so severely understaffed by the 1930s that patients' deaths were often not discovered until days later, when they were found rotting in some forgotten corner. Shock therapy and lobotomies were standard procedures. In fact, some called Danvers the birthplace of the prefrontal lobotomy. But a large cemetery on site said to be haunted by evil spirits suggests these were not always successful. The sinister castle-like building is said to have inspired H.P. Lovecraft's Arkham Sanitarium and so also Batman's Arkham Asylum and was the setting of Demon Movie Session 9. And as if that weren't enough, Danvers used to be Salem Village. Yeah, of Salem witch trials fame. Regular ghosts are one thing, witch ghosts are another one altogether. Think about how few people would have had to work here where a literal patient would die and wouldn't be discovered until days later. And also think about what that would have meant for the actual patients. That means that even if you were still alive, you probably wouldn't be treated or seen by a professional for days at a time. Which also means that you might not eat for days at a time either and be stuck in what I can only assume would have been a cell by yourself for that entire time. This would have been a horrible place to go, even if it was just for criminals. Because of all of this, it is now deeply haunted and a place I highly recommend avoiding. And finally, number one on this list is the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. This is an asylum that I've talked about a few times on this channel before, which speaks to how haunted it actually is. Thrillist says, with an alleged 63,000 deaths taking place inside its walls, this place is up to its eyeballs and spirits, not surprisingly topping lists of America's most haunted spots. Originally built as a tuberculosis hospital in 1910, the building saw many die from the disease, but tales of mistreatment and dubious human experimentation trickled out, and patients left the premises in what was known as the death tunnel or body shoot. Apparitions including Timmy, a boy who likes to play with rubber balls who's been caught on tape, the nurse who hanged herself in room 502, another nurse who fell from the same room's window, and scattered screams and footsteps have all been seen. 63,000 deaths. And here we were thinking that the 9,000 in the other place was bad, here's 63,000 more. Any place that has a death tunnel and a body shoot, that should not be a place meant for rehabilitation and seeking help. We are talking about some sick stuff that went on here. I would get into some of the rumors associated with the human experimentation, but I honestly don't think that YouTube would let this video stay up if I did. There are a plethora of ghostly spirits that haunt this place now. Dark spirits that have lost all sense of humanity and are more demon than spirit. This is a spot that must be avoided at all costs.